Hello, everyone. We're here at the Portland Public Library with Sarah Karloff. Hello, Sarah. Hello. How are you? I'm great. I'm, I'm honored to be here with you. Well, thank you. Your father had a big impact on my life and on many lives of kids growing up. He did indeed. You know, I, he is one of those voices that I grew up with and a man who influenced me. He was just a charming gentleman when he was out of the, uh, the makeup, which we'll show a little later. He, he really was. He was a delightful human being. He was warm and funny, very well-educated, very cultured, very soft-spoken. As a child who grew up reading Famous Monsters of Filmland and uh, Calvin T. Beck's Castle of Frankenstein, I wondered, were you on any of the sets? I did have an opportunity to visit several of the sets, but not the Frankenstein sets, mm -hmm. because no matter what you may think, I wasn't born when those were made. I never, ever assumed that. <laughs> You're too, much too lovely. Oh, well, I was born, however, when he was making Son of Frankenstein. Really? I was born on my father's 51st birthday. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, I, I probably was the most expensive birthday present he ever got. <laughs> I read somewhere, um, your dad did about 50 movies before Frankenstein, is that correct? Actually, Frankenstein was his 81st film. Um, no one saw the first 80. That, I was off by 30, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, he did um, approximately 170 films. But Frankenstein was his 81st film. That's an amazing body of work. You know, on uh, eBay, I just picked up... Oh, Targets. Targets he made with Peter Bogdanovich. It was one of the last films he made, and, and I think probably one of his favorite films. Um, he really? really enjoyed working with Peter. He um, admired his creativity and his talent, his energy, and uh, in it, brilliant casting. He played an aging horror film star. He really um, liked doing that film, and in it he had a soliloquy in it that he did in one take, and um, um, at the end of doing that soliloquy, uh, all the crew stood up and applauded. Really? Which was really a, a wonderful exit line to a wonderful career for my father. Now, talking about energy, you came all the way out from the West Coast to speak here in Portland, Maine, which is one of my favorite places. Um, that's so nice of you. Well, it, it's a wonderful opportunity for us. I really do like the exhibit that's here at the Portland Library. It's called Frankenstein Penetrating the Secrets of Nature, and it is um, supported by the uh, National Library of Medicine, and the uh, and National Endowment for the Humanities. It uh, originally was at the National Library of Medicine in um, Bethesda, Maryland in 1997. It was there for 13 months, and then uh, it, is, uh, it got some funding, and it is now touring 80 cities over a four-year period, and Portland, Maine is one of the cities that it's visiting. That's amazing. Will you go to some of the other cities, too? I've had an opportunity to visit about seven other cities so far, and before the, the uh, tour is finished at, uh, in the middle of uh, 2006, I'll have an opportunity to visit about 10 or 12 more cities. It's a wonderful exhibit. It uses Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and uh, uh, the entire story as a hook to get uh, uh, people into libraries, uh, to ponder some of the questions um, sociologically and theologically and medically to uh, have them think about some of the questions her story poses. And it brings people into libraries and uh, ha gets people to think about some of the questions society is, is, is presented with today. That's an important task, too, bringing people into libraries. I noticed, I, I do a lot of research in libraries. People were drifting away from them then computers came in and people started coming back. Well, that's true. Uh, th this, this particular exhibit is, is multi-generational in its appeal. Um, it, it, uh, it really captivates the imagination of young and old alike. It's an important exhibit, and I do hope people will come. If not, they don't have an opportunity to come here to the Portland, uh, Portland Main Library. I do hope they'll look on the Internet, uh, maybe visit our website at www.karloff.com and see where else this exhibit is uh, uh, is going to be and visit this uh, one of the libraries that it's going to be appearing at. So you keep the updates on the on your webpage? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. There's a beautiful photo of you there. Oh, 
Thank you very much. Robert Barry Franco's in New York emailed and said, here's a picture of Sarah, and it was your website. Oh, well, so. that's very nice. We do have a website. Um, we try to keep it updated. Uh, we ex we have a uh, one of the, uh, the pages on our website is an artist gallery. Um, we uh, exhibit the artwork of various Karloff artists, and we try to give them exposure for their art uh, that they might not get elsewhere. Um, and we have a tribute section where we uh, display the letters people have written me about my father, and we get some marvelous letters from people from all over the world uh, who just have written me just warm and wonderful things about my father. Um, and we have um, we have a merchandise section where we display the merchandise of various licensees. Um, it's it's a fun web page. We try to make it fun for the fans of my father. Outside of him being such a great character in so many of these movies, he was a really great actor. Thank you. He, he, he was. He really was. As I said earlier, he made 170 films. Um, he had an enormous body of radio work. He did about 20 children's albums. He appeared on Broadway in Arsenic and Old Lace. He was in Peter Pan. He was nominated for a Tony in, uh, opposite Julie Harris in The Lark. Um, and my roommate, Jeff Brown, wanted to tell you he saw your father in The Lark. Oh, really? His grandmother took him. He was about eight or nine, and he loved it. Oh, it was a wonderful play, of course. You didn't know your father was great on stage. Oh, he was. He, he would, he, the, the, when he was first offered the part in Arsenic and Old Lace, he was scared to death about doing legitimate theater. But he, uh, ultimately, I think every actor really enjoys legitimate theater because you get instant gratification, instant feedback from the audience. But... He really, um, he had, my father had a, a, a marvelous career because he did do so many films, so much radio, uh, had an opportunity to do quite a bit of legitimate theater. Uh, he did, as I said, so much uh, uh, recording for children in particular. Uh, he had three television series of his own. Um, and he, you know, he had a... He had an opportunity to work right, almost right up until the day he died in 1969. Which was tremendous. Yeah. I was downloading the messages from my phone machine, and your voice was on, and, and um, Jeff walks in. I said, Jeff, come over here. And he goes, Sarah Koloff, you must tell her, you know, it was the Joan of Arc play, I guess. Yes, it was. But yes. he really wanted to impress upon you how, as a young kid, your father really Im impressed him, too. But that was from the other spectrum, because... For me, it was the films. For him, it was the stage. Well, that's that's wonderful to know because, um, you know, so many so many times my father was asked if he minded being typecast, and he always said no, indeed not, because he he felt that he was so lucky to have established a trademark mm -hmm. in his own profession. But again, then he won a Grammy for How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Sure. So although he was typecast as Frankenstein, he also had a very broad broad uh, career and um, he he left his mark on Halloween but he also left his mark on Christmas which is delightful that is true when I was a child I found this have you ever seen it oh yes Tales of Terror edited by Boris Karloff yeah. great little collection my father was an avid reader he was he was very well educated and he was a voracious reader his favorite um, author was Joseph Conrad oh yeah now, did that rub off on you? Do you read a lot? Not as much as I'd like to. It's hard to find the time in, in today's times, but I, I read whenever I have an opportunity to. Last night, how was it here last night when you, did you do a lecture? Uh, well, I gave, I, I made a few remarks about my father, his life, his career, his work with the Screen Actors Guild. Uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful evening. It was a, uh, um, it was a, a a very multi-generational audience, which was lovely. There were people from young people sitting on the floor and, and people of my age sitting on the chairs. But it was a lot of fun. It really was. I think people enjoyed the film. They showed Frank, the original Frankenstein. And um, everybody stayed through for the entire film. So I think uh, it, was, it was enjoyed by everyone. So I know I had a good time. We're going to take a, a quick break, and we'll be right back with Sarah Karloff. And on visual radio with Sarah Karloff. Let's talk a little bit about your life. Um, where did you grow up? I was born in Hollywood and lived in Beverly Hills. And then uh, at about age seven, I moved to San Francisco, where I spent the rest of my growing up years. 
-hmm. I'm not saying this because you're in front of me and I don't want to flatter you, but you're beautiful. Have you ever thought of a film? Heavens no. Thank you very much for the compliment, but heavens no. 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 Oh, you'd probably be great in it. Well, I don't know. Um, it, it's a lot of hard work and, and it takes being on the right corner at the right time. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just not something I ever really wanted to do. My father, my father said, uh, one time I went back uh, to watch him um, in Chicago in Peter Pan, and he arranged for me to um, see it from the wings and see it from backstage and see it from out front. And, and after a week of, of, watch, of, of visiting with him and seeing the play, he, he said to me, I can tell you don't have the fire in the belly because you paid more attention to Nana the dog than you did to me. So at that point, I think it was clear to both him and to me that I was never going to become an actress. That's pretty funny. With all these films being resurrected now for, for DVD, um, have, have they talked to you about the archiving or about going over some of the old tapes to preserve them? Well, actually, the studios own the films. Mm -hmm. And... Um, most studios care more about what's coming up than preserving their own uh, history and their own archives. Um, th they do resurrect the films, uh, those films that they think they can um, cash in on as far as video and DVD, but they don't need to nor do they consult with the families. The families don't have a monetary interest in them and the studios don't have an historical interest in them. That's such a shame because some of that magic is just an important part of our, our whole heritage as a race. Well, it is a shame, um, but it is a fact also. Um, with your father's 80 or so films before Frankenstein, is there a way that you could go back and even get clips for some kind of a biopic? Uh, the studios are quite possessive of the clips as well. They, when documentaries are made, and when biographies are made of uh, celebrities, uh, those companies that do those sorts of films do have to go to the studios and get uh, permission to use clips, and they do have to pay for the use of those clips. Uh, in some instances, and in the instance of clips use, uh, clip use of my father's films, they do have to have my permission also. I have an agreement with the st uh, studios for, uh, for clip usage. Um, and my position on that is I encourage the use of clips. Uh, and I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, my attitude is if it has to work for the licensee uh, for it to work at all. So I encourage that in every way that I can. But ultimately, it's up to the studio as to whether or not a clip can be used. I work with a, uh, a rock singer by the name of Pratt. And his wife told me that possibly the Pratt family came in on the Mayflower. Have you heard that? Um, I'm not sure we're from the same line of Pratt's, although Pratt is my father's real name. Um, perhaps the singer with whom you work did. I, I don't, my father's lineage did not come over to this country. Oh, so they were in England. Yeah, my, uh, my father's whole family stayed in England. Um, he was the youngest of nine children, and uh, they all stayed in England. He was the only one that came to this com uh, country, and actually, he came over to Canada first and spent the first ten years starving in, in British Columbia. Wow. Yeah. Um, with the 1930s and 40s classics, there's Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi. Then in the 50s, it was Peter Cushion and Chris Lee, and it seems that just two actors emerged from the whole pack that kind of identified those time periods. Did the uh, Hammer film series with, with Cushing and Lee help resurrect more interest in your father, do you think? Oh, I think it's hard to say. Um, you, you know, you can't leave out of the mix, of course, uh, Vincent Price and Peter Lorre, and they certainly weren't coupled. Um, and I adore them. Yes, and, and of course, uh, Vincent Price stands on his own legs. Yes. Um, and... Uh, I think that the Hammer films are of a different type of horror, f uh, of horror film. Um, I think the man that deserves a great deal of credit for resurrecting or keeping alive or, or introducing a new generation 
to the horror films or the classic horror films as as my father and Bayless uh, films were are referred to is Forrest Ackerman and Famous Monsters of Filmland. Um, his magazine uh, actually introduced a ho several generations of youngsters to the classic horror film genre and to the Karloff and Lugosi films through his magazine. And, and not only introduced that generation to those films, but to those actors and what those men were like. And um, I credit Forey for uh, as much as I do uh, uh, Christopher Lee and, and Peter Cushing and Hammer Films. I think that's fair to say. Uh, they, they credit Forrest for coming up with the term sci-fi. Oh, indeed. And he credits himself for that. <laughs> <laughs> I met Calvin T. Beck. I don't know if you knew. He had, uh, Forrest had competition called Castle of Frankenstein back in the... 60s and 70s and Calvin Beck was the Forrest Ackman of Castle of Frankenstein so it was kind of neat one of the two of the great magazine guys I think when there's a, a number one and a number two as with Hertz and Avis uh, each one benefits from the competition but it was it was great in those days I remember growing up just having those magazines around it and it's, I think it's fair to say Ackerman actually influenced we teenagers of the time because uh, I think he put us in directions to, to learn how to write just the way he had such enthusiasm, it came off the page. Oh, and he certainly was the prince of the pun. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. So you've read his magazines. I certainly have been exposed to them. That's wild. Uh, Sarah Koloff, it's been wonderful talking to you. Uh, I hope this exhibit keeps going. I'll have just a couple of final questions. As you go around the country, you probably get letters. Do you keep a diary? Or are you thinking of a book of any of your memories of all this? Uh, no, I'm not thinking of a book. Um, there have been so many bi really very excellent biographies written on my father. And um, there, uh, there is an, another one in the works now being written in England really? uh, that I think will be extraordinarily well researched. And there, which is not to say that the ones have, that have been written haven't been well researched. They certainly have. Um, and I really, uh, I've added as much as I can to the ones that have been written and the one that is currently being written. I, there's nothing more for me to uh, write about. Uh, and uh, I, I try to certainly keep in mind that this is not about me. Mm -hmm. This is about my father. And so for me to write um, a book would be I think inappropriate. Um, I have to, what I had, why people come, and when I do various uh, appearances or shows, they come, to, people come up to our table or up to me to ask me questions about my father, not about me. And um, there's no reason for me to write a book, really. Uh, the questions have to do with my father, the answers have to do about my father. And as long as, as I'm able, I'm more than delighted to, to travel the country and work with this exhibit or work with the post office or work with any, um, any of the licensees or, and work with the fans. I get probably 100 emails or more a day, and I answer them myself. But they are all about my father and not about me, and that's appropriate, and that's the way I hope to be able to keep it. Well, in this world of mommy dearests and, and, and expose books, you are doing a tremendous service to your dad's legacy and to the fans because you're, do, you're so positive and up-tempo, and that's so nice and, and different in this world. Well, my father left such a remarkable legacy, both personally and professionally, that it's appropriate that I uh, take the position that when his name and his likeness is used, that it's done in, a, in, a, in an appropriate and in a tasteful and, and um, dignified manner because that's the kind of man he was. My final topic will be, now that a movie like Gods and Monsters has come out, which was wonderful and, and gave a nice look at James Whale, would you like to be involved in maybe a biography of Boris Karloff and, and oversee how a movie on your father will be made? There was a, uh, there was a very nice biography on my father done of, uh, for A&E. Uh, a friend of ours, Kevin Burns, not Ken Burns, but Kevin Burns, uh, did one for A&E, and it was, it was wonderful. 
um, he was a fan uh, and now has become a friend. Um, there have been um, attempts or there has been interest uh, exp uh, expressed uh, on and options taken on uh, one of the biographies written on my father, but there is no hook, there is no, there's no scandal. So there is no box office for a movie. And I doubt that uh, a film would ever be made on my father for that very reason. If you don't have a um, scandal, if you don't have a hook, uh, there's no box office, there is no film. Well, that says something about the world, and that isn't fair. Well, you know, my father, uh, my father's one of the very few celebrities about whom nothing negative was ever written and said. It's that kind of legacy that I uh, try to protect and maintain for him. And so I'm delighted there's no film. Well, we thank you for your, for your time. And it's just amazing that you're doing this for your dad and for the fans. And we it's hope you a have a lot of fun. Well, great. And uh, hopefully we'll see the exhibit as you keep touring the country. Thank you. I hope you will. I hope you will see it. I hope a lot of people see it. And I know they'll enjoy it when they come to see it. Sarah Karloff on Visual Radio. And thanks to the Portland Library. And I'm going to go to the beach now. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> hope. I mean, I'm up here. I love Maine. I do, too. I've had a wonderful time. There's going to be a lobster shortage now. I've eaten all the lobster I, I, lobster every day I've been here. It's too bad you can't stay for the entire weekend. Well, I wish I could, but I have to go home. My grandchildren are coming. Ah, well, that, that's something to look forward to. It certainly is. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You know what? I got something I want to tell you, you know. I've got to be happy and free Living and loving for me I've got to be happy and free Living and loving for me I've got to be happy and free, yeah. living and loving, loving just for me. I've got to be happy and free, living and loving for me. I've got to be happy and free, living and loving for me, just a natural.